Hello and welcome to Being Prodigy. Now put on your headphones and start learning. To get special study material, just contact us through the link in the description. Farn assumed that the economy was closed, that it did not interact with the rest of the world. This was done to keep the model simple and explain the basic macroeconomic mechanisms. In reality, most modern economies are open. Interaction with other economies of the world widens choice in three broad ways. I, consumers and firms have the opportunity to choose between domestic and foreign goods. This is the product market linkage which occurs through international trade. Two, investors have the opportunity to choose between domestic and foreign assets. This constitutes the financial market linkage. Three, firms can choose where to locate production and workers to choose where to work. This is the factor market linkage. Labor market linkages have been relatively less due to various restrictions on the movement of people through immigration laws. Movement of goods has traditionally been seen as a substitute for the movement of labor. We focus here on the first two linkages. An open economy is one that trades with other nations in goods and services and, most often, also in financial assets. Indians, for instance, enjoy using products produced around the world and some of our production is exported to foreign countries. Foreign trade, therefore, influences Indian aggregate demand in two ways. First, when Indians buy foreign goods, this spending escapes as a leakage from the circular flow of income decreasing aggregate demand. Second, our exports to foreigners enter as an injection into the circular flow, increasing aggregate demand for domestically produced goods. Total foreign trade, exports plus imports, as a proportion of GDP is a common measure of the degree of openness of an economy. In 2014 to 2015, this was 48.8% for the Indian economy. There are several countries whose foreign trade proportions are above 50% of GDP. Now, when goods move across national borders, money must move in the opposite direction. At the international level, there is no single currency that is issued by a central authority. Foreign economic agents will accept a national currency only if they are convinced that the currency will maintain a stable purchasing power. Without this confidence, a currency will not be used as an international medium of exchange and unit of account since there is no international authority with the power to force the use of a particular currency in international transactions. Governments have tried to gain confidence of potential users by announcing that the national currency will be freely convertible at a fixed price into another asset, over whose value the issuing authority has no control. This other asset most often has been gold, or other national currencies. There are two aspects of this commitment that has affected its credibility, the ability to convert freely in unlimited amounts and the price at which conversion takes place. The international monetary system has been set up to handle these issues and ensure stability in international transactions. A nation's commitment regarding the above two issues will affect its trade and financial interactions with the rest of the world. The balance of payments, the balance of payments, BOP, record the transactions in goods, services and assets between residents of a country with the rest of the world for a specified time period, typically a year. BOP surplus and deficit The essence of international payments is that just like an individual who spends more than her income must finance the difference by selling assets or by borrowing, a country that has a deficit in its current account, spending more abroad than it receives from sales to the rest of the world, must finance it by selling assets or by borrowing abroad. Thus, any current account deficit is of necessity financed by a net capital inflow. Alternatively, the country could engage in official reserve transactions, running down its reserves of foreign exchange, in the case of a deficit by selling foreign currency in the foreign exchange market. The decrease, increase, in official reserves is called the overall balance of payments deficit, surplus. The basic premise is that the monetary authorities are the ultimate financiers of any deficit in the balance of payments or the recipients of any surplus. The balance of payments deficit or surplus is obtained after adding the current and capital account balances. This is Being Prodigy. To get special study material, just contact us through the link in the description. And please subscribe to show your support. This was the amount of addition to official reserves. A country is said to be in balance of payments equilibrium when the sum of its current account and its non-reserve capital account equal zero so that the current account balance is financed entirely by international lending without reserve movements. 
We note that the official reserve transactions are more relevant under a regime of pegged exchange rates than when exchange rates are floating. Autonomous and accommodating transactions, international economic transactions are called autonomous when transactions are made independently of the state of the BOP, for instance due to profit motive. These items are called above the line items in the BOP. The balance of payments is said to be in surplus, deficit, if autonomous receipts are greater, less, than autonomous payments. Accommodating transactions, termed below the line items, on the other hand, are determined by the net consequences of the autonomous items, that is, whether the BOP is in surplus or deficit. The official reserve transactions are seen as the accommodating item in the BOP, all others being autonomous. Errors and omissions constitute the third element in the BOP, apart from the current and capital accounts, which is the balancing item reflecting our inability to record all international transactions accurately. The foreign exchange market having considered accounting of international transactions on the whole, we will now take up a single transaction. Let us assume that an Indian resident wants to visit London on a vacation, an import of tourist services. She will have to pay in pounds for her stay there. She will need to know where to obtain the pounds and at what price. Her demand for pounds would constitute a demand for foreign exchange which would be supplied in the foreign exchange market, the market in which national currencies are traded for one another. The major participants in this market are commercial banks, foreign exchange brokers and other authorized dealers and the monetary authorities. It is important to note that, although the participants themselves may have their own trading centers, the market itself is worldwide. There is close and continuous contact between the trading centers and the participants deal in more than one market. The price of one currency in terms of the other is known as the exchange rate. Since there is a symmetry between the two currencies, the exchange rate may be defined in one of the two ways. First, as the amount of domestic currency required to buy one unit of foreign currency, that is a rupee dollar exchange rate of Rs 50 means that it costs Rs 50 to buy one dollar, and second, as the cost in foreign currency of purchasing one unit of domestic currency. In the above case, we would say that it costs two cents to buy a rupee. The practice in economic literature, however, is to use the former definition, as the price of foreign currency in terms of domestic currency. This is the bilateral nominal exchange rate, bilateral in the sense that they are exchange rates for one currency against another and they are nominal because they quote the exchange rate in money terms, that is so many rupees per dollar or per pound. Determination of the exchange rate The question arises as to why the foreign exchange rate one is at this level and what causes its movements. To understand the economic principles that lie behind exchange rate determination, we study the major exchange rate regimes to that have characterized the international monetary system. This is Being Prodigy. To get special study material, just contact us through the link in the description. And please subscribe to show your support. There has been a move from a regime of commitment of fixed price convertibility to one without commitments where residents enjoy greater freedom to convert domestic currency into foreign currencies but do not enjoy a price guarantee. Flexible exchange rates in a system of flexible exchange rates are also known as floating exchange rates. The exchange rate is determined by the forces of market demand and supply. In a completely flexible system, the central banks follow a simple set of rules. They do nothing to directly affect the level of the exchange rate. In other words, they do not intervene in the foreign exchange market, and therefore, there are no official reserve transactions. The link between the balance of payments accounts and the transactions in the foreign exchange market is evident when we recognize that all expenditures by domestic residents on foreign goods, services and assets and all foreign transfer payments, debits in the BOP accounts, are also represent demand for foreign exchange. The Indian resident buying a Japanese car pays for it in rupees but the Japanese exporter will expect to be paid in yen, so rupees must be exchanged for yen in the foreign exchange market. Conversely, all exports by domestic residents reflect equal earnings of foreign exchange. For instance, Indian exporters will expect to be paid in rupees and, to buy our goods, foreigners must sell their currency and buy rupees. Total credits in the BOP accounts are then equal to the supply of foreign exchange. Another reason for the demand for foreign exchange is for speculative purposes. Speculation, exchange rates in the market depend not only on the demand and supply of exports and imports, and investment in assets, 
but also in foreign exchange speculation where foreign exchange is demanded for the possible gains from appreciation of the currency. Money in any country is an asset. If Indians believe that the British pound is going to increase in value relative to the rupee, they will want to hold pounds. For instance, if the current exchange rate is Rs 80 to a pound and investors believe that the pound is going to appreciate by the end of the month and will be worth Rs 85, investors think if they took Rs 80,000 and bought 1,000 pounds, at the end of the month, they would be able to exchange the pounds for Rs 85,000, thus making a profit of Rs 5,000. This expectation would increase the demand for pounds and cause the rupee pound exchange rate to increase in the present, making the belief self-fulfilling. The above analysis assumes that interest rates, incomes and prices remain constant. However, these may change and that will shift the demand and supply curves for foreign exchange. Interest rates and the exchange rate, in the short run, another factor that is important in determining exchange rate movements is the interest rate differential that is the difference between interest rates between countries. There are huge funds owned by banks, multinational corporations and wealthy individuals which move around the world in search of the highest interest rates. If we assume that government bonds in country A pay a 8% rate of interest whereas equally safe bonds in country B yield 10%, the interest rate differential is 2%. Investors from country A will be attracted by the high interest rates in country B and will buy the currency of country B selling their own currency. At the same time investors in country B will also find investing in their own country more attractive and will therefore demand less of country A's currency. This means that the demand curve for country A's currency will shift to the left and the supply curve will shift to the right causing a depreciation of country A's currency and an appreciation of country B's currency. Thus, a rise in the interest rates at home often leads to an appreciation of the domestic currency. Here, the implicit assumption is that no restrictions exist in buying bonds issued by foreign governments. Income in the exchange rate, when income increases, consumer spending increases. Spending on imported goods is also likely to increase. When imports increase, the demand curve for foreign exchange shifts to the right. There is a depreciation of the domestic currency. If there is an increase in income abroad as well, domestic exports will rise and the supply curve of foreign exchange shifts outward. On balance, the domestic currency may or may not depreciate. What happens will depend on whether exports are growing faster than imports. In general, other things remaining equal, a country whose aggregate demand grows faster than the rest of the world normally finds its currency depreciating because its imports grow faster than its exports. Its demand curve for foreign currency shifts faster than its supply curve. Exchange rates in the long run, the purchasing power parity PPP, theory is used to make long-run predictions about exchange rates in a flexible exchange rate system. According to the theory, as long as there are no barriers to trade like tariffs, taxes on trade, and quotas, quantitative limits on imports, exchange rates should eventually adjust so that the same product costs the same whether measured in rupees in India, or dollars in the US, yen in Japan and so on, except for differences in transportation. Over the long run, therefore, exchange rates between any two national currencies adjust to reflect differences in the price levels in the two countries. According to the PPP theory, differences in the domestic inflation and foreign inflation are a major cause of adjustment in exchange rates. If one country has higher inflation than another, its exchange rate should be depreciating. However, we note that if American prices rise faster than Indian prices and, at the same time, countries erect tariff barriers to keep Indian shirts out, but not American ones, the dollar may not depreciate. Also, there are many goods that are not tradable and inflation rates for them will not matter. Further, few goods that different countries produce and trade are uniform or identical. Most economists contend that other factors are more important than relative prices for exchange rate determination in the short run. However, in the long run, purchasing power parity plays an important role. Fixed exchange rates countries have had flexible exchange rate system ever since the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system in the early 1970s. Prior to that, most countries had fixed or what is called pegged exchange rate system, in which the exchange rate is pegged at a particular level. Sometimes, a distinction is made between the fixed and pegged exchange rates. It is argued that while the former is fixed, 
the latter is maintained by the monetary authorities, in that the value at which the exchange rate is pegged, the par value, is a policy variable, it may be changed. There is a common element between the two systems. Under a fixed exchange rate system, such as the gold standard, adjustment to BOP surpluses or deficits cannot be brought about through changes in the exchange rate. Adjustment must either come about automatically through the workings of the economic system, through the mechanism explained by Hume, given below or be brought about by the government. A pegged exchange rate system may, as long as the exchange rate is not changed, and is not expected to change, display the same characteristics. However, there is another option open to the government, it may change the exchange rate. A devaluation is said to occur when the exchange rate is increased by social action under a pegged exchange rate system. The opposite of devaluation is a revaluation. Or, the government may choose to leave the exchange rate unchanged and deal with the BOP problem by the use of monetary and fiscal policy. Most governments change the exchange rate very infrequently. In our analysis, we use the terms fixed and pegged exchange rates interchangeably to denote an exchange rate regime where the exchange rate is set by government decisions and maintained by government actions. International experience shows that it is precisely this that has led many countries to abandon the system of fixed exchange rates. Fear of such an attack induced the U.S. to let its currency float in 1971, one of the major events which precipitated the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system. Managed floating without any formal international agreement, the world has moved on to what can be best described as a managed floating exchange rate system. It is a mixture of a flexible exchange rate system, the float part, and a fixed rate system, the managed part. Under this system, also called dirty floating, central banks intervene to buy and sell foreign currencies in an attempt to moderate exchange rate movements whenever they feel that such actions are appropriate. Official reserve transactions are, therefore, not equal to zero. This is Being Prodigy. To get special study material, just contact us through the link in the description. And please subscribe to show your support. Thank you and happy learning.